my name's Peter, if you can see me, and I'm the chair of Cork Astronomy Club. Uh, hello to um, everyone who's joined this Cork Astronomy Club lockdown lecture. The main feature of tonight's meeting will be we'll be hearing from Amanda Bauer. Uh, Amanda is joining us from Tucson, Arizona, uh, where the cactuses thrive. Uh, Amanda is deputy director of something called the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. But uh, the telescope she's going to talk to us about tonight isn't actually in Arizona, it's in Chile. It's uh, not yet built, but uh, when it is, it will be addressing some of the most pressing questions about the structure and evolution of the universe. And there will be opportunities for citizen scientists. And citizen scientists, that means you and me. Let me hand her over to Amanda now. And Amanda, thanks very much for taking time out from your busy day to talk to us here in Cork. Amanda Bauer. Thank you, Peter, and thanks everyone. I see there's about 100 people on, on the call, so that's a really great turnout. Um, I like the name of your meetings too. <laughs> it's great. Thank you very much for having me, and thank you very much for your interest in the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. Go ahead and share my screen now. So the Vera C. Rubin Observatory, the universe in action coming soon. This is a facility that's under construction in Chile right now. It's been, oh, in the design and construction phase for nearly 20 years now. So it's, it's a long time coming, um, but we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. We should probably finish this up in the next two years or so, and then we'll be able to get our eyes on the Southern Hemisphere sky. I say it's the universe in action because this telescope, as I'll describe later on in the talk, will look at every part of the southern sky about every three or four nights. And so it will get a new image of every part of the sky and then process that to look for things that have changed. Either they get brighter or fainter or have moved or appeared or disappeared. And we will send alerts out to the public uh, every night describing all the things that have changed. And so this is the first time that an observatory has had the capacity at this scale to be able to look at the universe in action and really see what's changing. So it's a pretty spectacular task that they're undertaking and I'm looking forward to telling you all about that. So today, in today's presentation, I will tell you about what the Rubin Observatory is. And some of you might have heard of LSST. That was our name until last year. So I'll tell you what that stands for now. It still exists, but we've changed what the acronym means. Um, and then I'll talk to you about what was the design um, what was the telescope designed for? So some of the, the main science goals that we have with this telescope and its survey, and then what's being planned for the public. So I have two hats in the project. One is the deputy director of the observatory operations. So when we start actually observing the night sky, and the other one is the head of the education and public outreach group. So we uniquely have been funded by the National Science Foundation to build a program for the public at the same time that the construction project is being built. And so we've spent a lot of time thinking about that infrastructure and the development um, so that the public has access to this data and a way to also contribute to the discovery process. Uh, the first thing I wanna show you is a video. That's sort of a, a quick overview of what the observatory is. The night sky, our window to the universe beyond, immense, mysterious, powerful, quietly beautiful. Cosmic events at the edge of our imagination unfold in the darkness, ready to be discovered. When we look at the night sky, we see into the past. Untold stories carried through space by light. The great historian of the cosmos. Technology has evolved over centuries, allowing us to look farther to the edge of our horizon. We invented telescopes to explore and cameras to capture these traveling messages. 
yet the changing cosmos remains unseen. A new telescope opens its eye and captures it all, the objects that move and those that flash, even those we cannot see with our eyes. Every few nights, it covers the sky, finding all that has changed. And within minutes, new glimmers of activity are carried around the Earth to anyone waiting to explore them. What will you discover that no one has seen before? It's time to find out. That was a fun video that we made uh, last year. So the Vera C. Rubin Observatory is conducting the Legacy Survey of Space and Time. That's what we've changed LSST into. It's, it's a combination of quite a few parts. So it's the biggest digital camera that exists in the world, suspended above an 8.4 meter mirror, and it takes a single image the size of 40 full moons. So that's one image covers 40 full moons um, at incredible resolution. And so what are we doing with this facility? We're doing the legacy survey of space and time, which will capture an image of the entire southern sky every three or four nights for 10 years. So we will get an unprecedented look at how the sky changes. And you'll also be able to add all of those images together to see deeper and deeper and deeper as time goes on. So I'll talk to you today about how you actually define uh, the telescope structure in order to be able to do this and what we're gonna find out from uh, that survey. The telescope was renamed after Vera Rubin uh, last year. She was really fundamental in the study of dark matter. So she made essential contributions that really influenced uh, the entire community and our understanding of dark matter and used state-of-the-art technology at the time, so really used observational techniques to answer these exciting scientific questions. She also advocated for women um, and more inclusivity in, sight, in, in science, which is particularly um, meaningful today on International Women's Day. So to honor her legacy, we ask everyone to refer to us as, as Rubin Observatory, or just Rubin for short, instead of the acronyms, we're all very fond of acronyms. So we're trying to, to keep her name at the forefront of, of our minds um, and honor her by using Rubin Observatory. This is the telescope. This is the current state of the telescope. This was an image that was taken last week on Monday. This is a peak in the Andes Mountains in Chile. It's called Serra Pachon. Um, you can see that massive crane right there where they lifted uh, this piece of the, the telescope assembly. They lifted it off the ground to place it on top of, of that telescope mount. And it's just, oh, it, it's kind of stunning just to see this view and to see it all coming together um, after so many years of construction. So things are coming together. We still have a bit more uh, of the construction work to do. The actual primary mirror is up on the mountain. Uh, the camera itself still is sitting in California. So why does a telescope look like it does? What have we uh, designed it to be? I'll tell you about some of the features of it. This is um, a map. So the telescope lives in South America. It's in Chile right here. It's about a six hour drive north of Santiago to get to La Serena and then another hour and a half drive to go into the mountains down the Elke Valley up to where Sarah Pachon is. Uh, other telescopes that live up on this, these mountain ranges, um, CTIO and the Gemini Telescope are ones you might have heard of before. I got to visit about two years ago when we were in a state of construction. I'm really looking forward to being able to go back. Um, and you can see the actual telescope structure itself that lives inside of this, this piece up on top. So it's a pretty modern looking facility as far as uh, telescope domes go. The primary mirror is a really interesting um, design feat. <laughs> this mirror took about seven years to build and it was actually forged in a uh, laboratory that lives underneath the football stadium at the University of Arizona. So after it was finished being fabricated, I got to go see it. This is it in the bottom right with a protective blue coating on it. And you can notice that an interesting feature of this mirror is that it's got two 
curvatures on the same surface of the mirror. And that no other telescope has that, especially not one at the scale that this one was built on. And so why did we do that? It was so that when light comes in from space, it goes off the outside, that primary mirror surface, up to the secondary, down to the tertiary mirror, and then up into the camera. So that's the biggest digital camera in the world. It's suspended over the primary mirror, um, and it's about the size of a small car. And the reason that we built the telescope in this way is this design gives you a huge field of view and it's very compact. So you can see the whole side of the size of the telescope. It's wide to hold that eight meter primary, but it's not very long. So you can have a, a pretty small dome that surrounds it. And because it's shaped like this, it can move really quickly from one position to another. That uh, telescope was fabricated in Tucson and then made its way to Coquimbo through this tunnel. I don't know if anybody's heard of the Puclero Tunnel uh, in these mountain ranges. This essentially defines the width of how big you can make equipment to go up to that mountain <laughs> in any of those telescope facilities. It was within inches of the edge of that tunnel. It's pretty spectacular to see. I, I was still in the US when that happened, but it was pretty amazing to watch that go. You can see it landed at the um, at the dock in Coquimbo, and then it was taken up to the mountaintop in 2019. Here's another one of my favorite photos of it being dragged up that dirt road all the way to the mountain. So here's the LSST facility up at the top. You can see the teal color, and that's Gemini and Soar over to the left. So you can imagine we were all holding our breath <laughs> very tightly as this thing went up the steep mountain road, uh, but it made it successfully, so it's a success story in the end. So moving to the digital camera, this camera is absolutely gigantic, the, small, the, the size of a small car. Uh, this is all of the CCDs on here. Uh, in total, it's a 3200 megapixel camera. It's being assembled in California. And then you can see there are six different filters that go in here. Uh, this filter exchanger, uh, you can imagine the filters are it's almost a meter across, and so they move those in, in front of that focal plane. It can hold five filters at a time, and there's also, it's the, similar to what the SDSS filters are, U-G-R-I-Z-Y, G-R-I-Z-Y, yep. Um, and the U filter um, is not in it all the time. We use the U filter more rarely than the other filters. So currently this uh, telescope lives in California. It'll probably be finished with its testing and ready to ship down to Chile hopefully mid next year. It's about the schedule that we're on right now. We got first light of the camera in its laboratory in California late last year. So this image has the most pixels ever in an image. And we created this by making a little uh, pinhole camera, essentially, and put a nice little Romanesco broccoli in it because when you do the exercise of zooming in and zooming in and zooming in, there's so much neat structure that you can get but we wanted to build this test case just so we could make sure that we were reading the CCDs. You can imagine with so many different uh, CCDs here, you wanna make sure you've got the orientation right and you don't have a little puzzle to put together at the end. So we tested that out. It was a, a wild success. And we did take some photos of something other than uh, vegetables. <laughs> this was an image we had printed out of Vera Rubin um, and took that image of her as well. So, so far everything looks like it's going pretty well. And so now we've got this, unique mirror, a very quickly moving telescope, and a huge camera. So it makes this system really fast for, for surveying the night sky. And so with this system, we are creating the legacy survey of space and time during its first 10 years in existence. So I'll tell you a little bit more about what that actually is and what kind of science we're gonna get out of there. So the images that are captured with this telescope are kind of ridiculously big. This is a 3.6 square degree field, so that's almost 10 square degrees across. This view is 60,000 pixels across, and you can see the size of the full moon, and this is one single image. So if you were gonna print out a single image from this telescope, you'd need a 70 by 70 foot piece of paper, which is not in metric, so I'll give you a different analogy, which is uh, the size of three tennis courts laid out. That would be a single image that we collect. So the, you can imagine you take an image of the sky and then the telescope moves, we take 30 second images and then the telescope moves very quickly to the next 
area of the sky, takes its 30 second image, moves to the next one. And that's how it can cover the entire southern hemisphere sky every few nights, because it just has this huge capacity, this field of view quickly, quickly moving. To give you some perspective on what that actually looks like, this is an image of the night sky from Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, many people have probably heard of SDSS if you've done some citizen science work before. So this is what SDSS looks like, and this is the same field of view that we predict will be imaged by Rubin. So the image I'm showing is actually from an eight meter Subaru telescope that lives in Hawaii, but it's processed through all the software that Rubin is developing right now. You can see the number of objects in this image. We can capture so many more faint objects and so much more of the fuzzy light on the outskirts of some of these galaxies. One of the big challenges is gonna be these really crowded fields. How do you distinguish the different objects in those crowded fields? And so we're working pretty hard right now on developing the software to be able to do that successfully. This project is gonna produce uh, data like we have never seen before. Every circle, if you imagine that these are each a pointing of the telescope, every single circle here has about 10 million galaxies in it. So every single image will have 10 million galaxies. And as we observe this over the course of the 10 years of the LSST, we'll be observing every point of sky about a thousand times in all the filters that we have. And so we'll see what these objects look like. Um, many different times. Most of the work I, I have done for my research was looking at lots of galaxies, but taking a single image or a single spectrum of those objects and then making all of my conclusions based on that. And so for the first time, we really get to see the subtle differences that happen over time um, for different kinds of objects. In total, this type of data, we're gonna be collecting 20 terabytes of data per night. And at the end of the survey, it'll be 15 petabytes of data which is kind of what exists on the internet right now. So part of this project is not only the telescope infrastructure, but also the ability to process, analyze, and store this level of data and make it accessible to astronomers. And that's one of the special things about it. It's not just that we're capturing the images, but we're also processing these objects. So this is a, a representation of the, I think it's a Whirlpool galaxy. Um, the images are automatically processed to measure every object's position, brightness, size, and shape. And then 40 billion objects will be cataloged in total. This is more objects by several times than humans that exist on Earth. This is the first astronomical survey that gets to that level, that number of cataloging objects that exist in the universe. All the code is open source. Um, and so if you really want to, you can go find the Rubin Observatory GitHub repository and check out all the code that's gonna be processing these things, at least in the versions that it exists right now. We still have another couple years of work to do on that code to process these things. But it's pretty spectacular what we're actually offering to scientists. In addition to processing the images, we're creating a, what's called a science platform for scientists to be able to go log into there and you can do your processing of the images there as opposed to sort of the traditional mechanism, which is either you do your own observations at some telescope and you take the data and download it onto your local machine and process it there. If you're talking about you know, billions and billions of objects, most people do not have a machine that can process that. And they also don't have access to some supercomputing facility, even through the university. And so we're providing uh, that compute power and those resources within the science platform that we're building up. This is another uh, shot from last week. That's just my favorite. You can see this top end assembly going on top of the structure inside of the dome. It's just Spectacular. It's still blowing my mind <laughs> what's happening down there. Uh, so I wanted to talk about what the observatory and the survey were actually designed to accomplish. So I'll give you some ideas of some of the science that we will be able to, to get to. There are four main areas of science that the system and the survey were designed to be able to achieve. One of those is the changing sky. So variable stars, uh, supernova exploding on the edges of galaxies, and active galactic nuclei. So as I mentioned before, I've studied galaxies and they've only ever been static, a single image, and now we get to see what kind of variability that they have. In addition to anything new that we might discover, this is opening up an entire new discovery space where we can't always predict what it is that we're gonna find, which is 
hard to convince people to give you money to do, <laughs> but super exciting when you actually see those serendipitous results coming out of, of this science. We expect to see roughly, I mentioned the alert stream. So we will be putting alerts out every single night um, and we expect to see about 10 million objects changing in some way every night. So getting brighter or fainter or moving or disappearing or appearing. And an, an alert will go out for each of these objects within one minute of it being observed at the telescope. So this is a huge computational challenge and one that uh, we'll be able to do, um, but it's just 10 million objects. It's pretty stunning how many things we're predicting are gonna be out there. And they can range from the objects I mentioned already to solar system things. So it'll be the solar system objects that are gonna be moving across the sky relative to the background objects, as you can see in this inset image here. At the end, what we expect is that we will have a census of objects in the catalog, in the, in the solar system that include 5 million main belt asteroids, about 300,000 Trojan asteroids, 100,000 near-Earth objects, and 40,000 Kuiper Belt objects. Those are the ones that are way out there by where, where Pluto is. That means we'll be measuring properties of about 10 to 100 times more objects than we currently know exist. And that really helps us understand how the solar system formed, how planets formed, how other solar systems could be forming around other stars. We'll also be contributing uh, quite a bit to finding asteroids. In particular, uh, various uh, people and entities are interested in the potentially dangerous ones, so those that are bigger than 140 meters in diameter, as far as away as the main belt asteroids. So cataloging somewhere between 60 and 90% of those potentially hazardous asteroids of that size will be something that we'll be contributing at a capacity that no, no other facility currently can. Mapping the Milky Way is another major area of research. So even just points of light uh, all the way out to the outskirts of the Milky Way, these, when you look at them in different filters, can give you a fossil record of our galaxy's history. Um, when you're looking at the colors of stars in different filters, you can get more information about their chemical makeup. So that can tell you things about its age, about the kind of timeline that it formed in, about the type of gas that it would have formed in, and the little neighborhood of stars around it that it would have formed in. And that starts to inform our understanding of how the Milky Way came to be. We can also see deeper. And so you can see on the left here, two galaxies, but on the right, when you start to look at deeper images, you can see these faint wisps and you can start to see these kinds of structures, which are most likely tiny, small galaxies that would have been completely torn apart and stripped by the gravity of this galaxy in the center. So all of these galaxies would have fallen in and formed and their stars would have gotten distributed as they passed through the different areas of uh, high density gas or dust um, and the gravity of that galaxy. So we'll be able to take a better count of the number of small galaxies that exist, both by looking at these kinds of images, but also by being able to see deep and counting the numbers. And then we can test that against the predictions that computer simulations tell us for the nature of dark matter. How many small galaxies should there be out there compared to how many we see? We don't really see as many as our models currently predict, so it'll be very interesting to see how that shapes up with the LSST. So speaking of dark matter, um, Vera Rubin, she contributed hugely to our observational understanding of dark matter. What she did was look at starlight and gas and, and light from gas um, around galaxies. <clears throat> and what you should see is that if you assume there's a certain amount of gravity from all the light that the stars produce, then you can predict that the speed of the stars looks something like that. So you get a lot of speed nearby, but as you go farther and farther away, they start to slow down because there's not as much gravity from the things creating the light. And so you get weaker and weaker as you move out away from the center of the galaxy. And her observations showed that that was not the case, that as you go farther and farther away, you start to have uh, gas and dust and stars moving much faster than they would be able to if you assume only gravity from the things that produce light. And so she did this over and over for many galaxies uh, and concluded that there had to be something there that was producing gravity but not light. 
And so that was the first real observational evidence we had of the existence of dark matter. And it completely changed the entire field of, of astronomy and opened up this area of dark matter research. So what we will be able to do with the Legacy Survey of Space and Time is map out the positions and brightnesses and colors and shapes of several billions of galaxies. And so based on their distribution through space, we can use techniques like gravitational lensing um, and that distribution to try to trace the underlying dark matter halos that exist around galaxies that you can't measure only through the light emitting properties unless you are able to take billions of them and you're able to do this at a, a statistical level. So we will uh, gain knowledge in not only dark matter but also dark energy. So with the last few minutes of my presentation, and I want to highlight that the Rubin Observatory has four main, we call them subsystems. There's the telescope in sight, there's the camera, and there's data management team. We also have the education and public outreach team, and this is completely unique among other facilities as they are being constructed. And so I wanted to take some time uh, to tell you about what that EPO program is building. The EPO mission is to offer accessible and engaging online experiences that provide non-specialists not only access to, but context for LSST data so that anyone can explore the universe and be part of the discovery process. And this has been a really fun um, challenge to try to develop programming with those goals in mind. So fundamentally we're building a website and this is going to incorporate interactive visuals throughout the website that allow you to transform a passive experience like uh, reading an article and seeing an image into an active one. So one thing that I've, I highlight here with screenshots and later on in the question session I've got some online demos queued up. So if anybody wants me to walk through a demo of what these things are going to look like, happy to do that. But in this one, it will take you through a series of images that were taken on different nights. You can see this galaxy in the background and then in one image, all of a sudden you see this bright object. So you can identify uh, that supernova that exploded. And then you identify where the galaxy is and we calculate um, the galaxy velocity and the distance to the supernova. And then you can populate those points on this Hubble plot. So it's the distance and the velocity. And as you identify more and more supernovae and the, their host galaxies, you can start to measure the slope of this line and that tells you the Hubble constant. And so it gives you your solution to how fast the universe is expanding. And so in this example, you go from actually seeing the image that the telescope creates to understanding how we conclude that the universe is expanding, which is just a fantastic thing to be able to do. We're making these available through you know, press releases and just on our website, but we're also creating an entire educational program um, that have about an hour or two hours worth of activities where the students get to go in and interact with this data and come to some of these major conclusions that they would have to in their classes anyway. Uh, the other thing that we've been able to do with the time we have in construction is make sure that this website and all of these features are mobile friendly and that they're shareable. So maybe you happen down a, ra one, a rabbit hole one time on the internet uh, and you land here and you uh, end up creating some amazing color image of a galaxy with one of the tools that we provide for you. You can then share that image on your social media, on Twitter, on Facebook, wherever you are, um, with a link to coming back to it. So you can share what you've created uh, and you can also get other people to do it. So this is a pretty exciting thing that we've been able to spend time uh, designing. One of the other major features that I'll highlight is called the Sky Viewer. This is a self-guided exploratory experience. So you'll be fed these color images of the whole southern sky. Um, you can zoom and pan and do whatever you want with it, but we also offer curation of interesting objects that you can go and explore a little bit further. So maybe you want the top 10 most distant supernova that Ruben has discovered, or the 10 most gorgeous galaxies, or uh, new asteroids that we never knew about before. Any of these kinds of things will be able to offer little tours that you can go explore, um, and then instead of kind of having to know what you're gonna do. So we can offer you some of the more interesting and beautiful things to look for, in addition to just saying, hey, last night we discovered 10 million objects, or you know, these are just some of the more exciting things. How do you, how does one, who is, might be interested filter through 10 million alerts in a night. So that's sort of some of the things that we're trying to do with this EPO team. 
this is uh, again just a design prototype that's going to be changing. <laughs> um, or you can go in and search for your favorite object and see what the, the Rubin image of that looks like. And then finally, I wanted to talk about citizen science. I know there's a lot of interest in citizen science among this group. We have been partnering with a group called the Zooniverse, and they're the organization that launched the first original uh, astronomy citizen science project, the Galaxy Zoo. And so they've been working for the last 10 years to build up this, this platform to provide citizen science opportunities. The details of what's happening with my team right now is we are incorporating a link from the science platform to the Zooniverse platform so that scientists can create any number of projects that they want that they think will be of value um, that citizens can contribute to. And so in the end, uh, once we start collecting data, which probably isn't going to be till about 2023, 2024, um, I am guessing that somewhere between 100 and 200 new citizen science projects using Rubin data will be coming out through the Zooniverse platform that you can participate in and contribute to um, and help with the discovery process. And they could be anything from new uh, supermassive black holes to galaxy structure to solar system objects. I, I can't even fathom what researchers are going to come up with um, to get you with hands on with this data. So finally, uh, this is the state of the telescope right now. We're on schedule for first light, first engineering light sometime next year, where we're actually get, gonna be able to get light into this dome, into the facilities and start processing it. Uh, you can see lots more photos at gallery.lsst.org or you can follow Rubin Observatory online. It's always kind of disappointing when I have to say, we're so excited, but you have to wait for another couple years. <laughs> That's the reality that we're in. That's what I've been working for for a couple years now. Um, and uh, with that, I just want to say thank you very much for your attention and your time. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, Amanda, I, I'm just, I, I just have three quick questions for you. Who's, who's funding the telescope? Why, what's the, what's the meaning of the word legacy? What's the force of that word, legacy? And my, my last question is, there must be a massive amount of energy consumed in all this computing. I suppose you have masses of solar panels out there in that sunny location, do you? <laughs> uh, great questions. So the first one, the telescope construction is being funded by the National Science Foundation in the US and also the Department of Energy. So for the construction effort, the National Science Foundation is funding about 75% of the costs and the Department of Energy funds the, the construction of the camera itself. So uh, fully funded by those two government agencies. The second question. Legacy, why legacy? What's that mean? Uh, <laughs> well, we did sort of a backwards hack. We uh, used to be called LSST, which is the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which frankly doesn't make sense. Could you tell me what that means? No. So we really liked the LSST and there was a recognition. So we wanted to try to keep that acronym, but just give it a different meaning. And so the legacy survey of space and time, uh, it's the first survey that will be capturing both things in space, but also in the time domain as well. So over and over and over. And legacy because it is something that we will uh, create and offer openly to anyone in the world to be able to use indefinitely. And the energy, the energy for all this computing. Yeah, so we are uh, currently working with a US data facility is the main place that will be housing the data and that's in California. It's powered by, the funded by the Department of Energy through um, Slack. And so that data facility exists now. And what we're doing on the operation side is we don't, we don't actually have full funding for the operations of the telescope yet. We're gonna be applying for that funding formally at the end of this year. Part of the package that we have in there is considering um, what we can do for conservation of energy once this uh, data start to flow. So I don't have final answers for you right now, but we do have a team working on that explicitly to work with the existing US data facility, but how we can conserve energy as much as we possibly can. Okay, and I'll ask uh, Linda and Declan if they'll select the uh, questions to uh, fire at Amanda. So, Amanda, you'll be getting some questions on quite a few of them, I suspect. A few Linda. there, yeah. I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce these properly, so I'm just going to give it a try. Are the mirrors in a parabolic, hyperbolic, episode configuration? 
The disadvantage is, I guess, a reduction in light gathering area, but what are the advantages? Right, so thank you. I'm very good on your pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm gonna interpret that question about the main primary and tertiary mirror, how the collecting area has two different curvatures on it. Um, I'm afraid you stumped me in that I know they're aspheroidal, but I don't know exactly if they're, uh, exactly how to describe the shape of them. I, I think they're ellipsoidal, but I'm not sure exactly what the technical term is. They were fabricated in a mirror system where you spin it, so they're symmetric on both sides, so that has to come out with ellipsoidal shape at some level. Um, and then the secondary mirror is hyperbolic up, up at the top. So you're right, the total diameter of the mirror is 8.4 meters, but the total effective collecting area of that primary surface is about 6.4 because we've carved out that, sec that tertiary part in the middle. Uh, the advantage of this is that we get the compact design that can move very quickly so we can actually achieve the scientific goals that we had with the telescope. Um, the reduction, uh, so that's the main, um, the main advantage of it. Yes, we, we lose a couple meters of collecting area, but we gain so much more in what we can actually do in the survey from that, that it was, it was worth it. The original like back of the envelope kind of, to, of drawing that somebody had was for the light to come through the telescope and have a big hole in the middle, and then you had a collecting surface way underneath it, uh, but that wasn't, it wasn't good to be able to move it around really quickly. So we went through quite a few iterations on the design and, and we weren't sure if it was even possible to create a single mirror surface with these two curvatures on it at the beginning, but we managed to solve that engineering challenge. Does the telescope have any extra mechanisms to deal with atmospheric effects or is it relying on its altitude for that? Yeah, so we are pretty high. We're at uh, 9,000 feet in those Andes. So that's pretty good as far as uh, altitude goes. Um, we don't have adaptive optics, the little fun lasers that you see coming out of some of those telescopes. We do have some active optics on the back of the mirrors. And we also have something called the auxiliary telescope. So this is sort of a small two meter telescope that lives next to the big telescope. And it actually observes in the same part of the sky at the same time that our big telescope does. And it does analysis of the atmosphere in that direction at the time that the telescope is observing. And that information gets put into the software that we use to process the image so that we can correct for the atmosphere after the fact based on those supplementary observations that we have. That was Declan Carey and we have Derek O'Keefe now. How far into the north sky can it see? Will amateurs in mid-northern hemisphere be able to help with follow-up observations from alerts? That might be a little bit too far north to capture um, the obser observations, but I am not entirely sure. So I'll have to follow up with you to see if they do overlap. <laughs> Uh, Ken Bond says, what is the altitude of this observatory and how much cloud does it experience? So we're, we're at 9,000 feet up in the Andes and on average that mountain range has about 80% um, observing nights uh, and an average over a year over the last 10 years or so. So it's pretty good. Pretty good. Okay, one last one. Uh, will you be able to see the massive black holes and how do you find them? <laughs> we love black holes. Uh, so the way that we observe black holes is they live in the centers of galaxies. And so we call them um, active galactic nuclei if the brightness from the center of the galaxy changes over time. So what that means is there's a, it's evidence of a supermassive black hole in the middle and maybe a star or a little cloud of gas or something gets very close to that supermassive black hole and starts to heat up and it starts to emit light. And so we would be able to detect whether that light from the center of the galaxy changes over time. So maybe there's a blip um, that happens for a year or even a smaller amount of time. And so observing those changes in brightness is how we start to identify those active galactic nuclei and then likely some other types of telescopes that would be able to narrow down into that center would then go and observe it with techniques like reverberation match it, ma mapping or x-rays or something like, or even gravitational waves, depending on what's, what's happening in there. 
Steve is wondering that when the observatory is up and running, will it be open to the public along with the other two neighbouring observatories? It likely will be. I mean, assuming we get beyond this COVID issue at some point, um, there's a, a parent organization that Rubin Observatory Operations will work within that was just formed about a year ago, and it's called Noir Lab. So it's N-O-I-R-L-A-B. And Noir Lab is the parent organization that will be organizing all of the public viewing. So I imagine we will certainly carry on public viewing, but it's not a telescope that astronomers get to go to every night. We are a survey telescope, so our uh, professionals get to do the observing, which is a bit sad for astronomers. If we're just trying to use the facility. Uh, but one of the things that we're doing um, with our EPO program is creating a virtual tour of the facility and the night observations. So you'll be able to go online. If you've got 3D glasses, you'll be able to look and kind of pretend like you're walking around, but you can also access that just through online. Uh, but in Chile in general, there's a huge astro tourism um, area where people kind of tour up and down the Andes and look at the different facilities. So I'm sure if you were able to reach out to the organization, we would be able to accommodate as much as we can safely. Colin was wondering, will the observatory be involved in the study of exoplanets? Yeah, that's an interesting one. So exoplanets isn't explicitly what the facility was designed to be able to find. I imagine what would happen is if you get a star that has some sort of variability um, that's not, you know, every three days or, you know, it's got some kind of different variability periodicity based on that planet um, orbiting in front of the star. Uh, the other thing that we could do is if the planet is, is orbiting this way, it might have changes in the, the position of that planet. So we would pick up the changes of the position of the star and we would flag that out as an alert. And so any kind of changes that come, once we send that out as an alert, we don't actually process the alerts. We don't tell you what is causing that change, but we are, uh, in, we are sending that data to groups that are called brokers. And we're in the process right now of working with about five different organizations around the world who will set up a brokering service. And they are interested in what caused that little blip in light. And they process it and they then tell you if this is a potential exoplanet, somebody else go look at it and verify that. So we're sort of the source of information and then other people get to process it and tell, tell you what's interesting and then you get to follow it up on other facilities. David was wondering, will Ruben be able to analyze spectra from deep sky, much older stars? Hmm. So Ruben itself is only an imaging facility. So it is uh, optical, a little bit of UV and a little bit of near infrared, but we don't collect spectra. What people will be able to do is in the science platform, take spectra from other facilities and map them with the imaging that, that Ruben provides. But we as a facility don't do spectroscopy. Okay. Um, kind of a, an engineering technical question from Jeffrey, given the, the altitude that it's based at, what kind of materials were used for the mirror? Yeah, fantastic. Oh, you're getting the good engineering ones. So uh, what they do to fabricate the mirror is they put in uh, these sort of hollow hexagonal pieces all over that form a honeycomb. And then they take chunks of glass and they uh, put those all across the surface and they cover the whole thing in this big old tank and they slowly raise the temperature as they're spinning that mirror. So all the glass melts into that honeycomb structure and forms the, the stability. I, th I think they had to do that twice to get the two different kinds of curvature. I actually am not entirely sure. Um, and so then once you've got that glass surface, then you polish it kind of buffer it up really smoothly. Um, and then we coat it. We actually put the coating on in Chile. We have a facility in that big building that is the coating plant. And so every two years, it's gonna get recoated. I do believe they were going through a couple different options for what the, the best reflectivity and longevity of the coating was. And I think they ended on aluminum. I have hmm. to verify that, but. Okay. Um. <laughs> Dennis poses an interesting que question. Given the sheer volume of data staggering, how are you going to store it? And is that going to have to be doubled up? Because you know, you're going to have to have a backup and the whole green issues associated with data centers at the moment because of all the energy they use is very topical. I uh, agree with that. 
Um, so the way the data is processed right now is it goes, it's collected at the facility. There's a, a very temporary storage there of maybe um, a couple hours. And then it gets sent through optical fibers down to a data facility in La Serena. So that's where uh, the data, there's a backup, a whole backup system in Chile and Chilean astronomers are actually able to access it through that center. Then it gets sent by two different sets of optical fibers. One goes up through Brazil, one goes to Santiago and then up through, I think one goes to Florida, one goes to Atlanta, and then they get sent to the US data facility, which is in Slack. Uh, the U.S. data facility is the bulk of where the processing of the data happens. So that whole data transfer, processing, and distributing of alert streams all happens within one minute. And then there's longer term processing that has to happen. So after 24 hours, uh, we make available the initial processing. And then once a year, there is a full data release that happens. And so that's the deep imaging added up the COADS over that full year. So to do that actual processing, uh, the majority of it is at the US data facility, but there's also a partnership in uh, France with IN2P3 and then some within the UK that also contribute some of the processing that goes into the final data release. Uh, so yes, there are backups in I think at least uh, France and in Chile of the whole system. We keep one year's worth of data accessible at any time and then the other ones uh, as you start to get more and more years of data go into like cold storage so they're there but they're not immediately accessible because that is cost and energy prohibitive so i already mentioned that we're working on um, our energy saving uh, portfolio and hopefully we'll have that in more detail by the end of the year as we submit our five-year proposal is there any similar telescope in the northern hemisphere and especially that has the same degree of public access. And finally, Roman wants to know, how do you remove the dust and dirt from the mirror? Well, I assume it doesn't get on there in the first place, but... <laughs> you blow really hard. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, currently, there is no other facility in the world like the Rubin Observatory. Our long-term um, intention is to try to build something similar in the Northern Hemisphere but there's a lot more total coverage of the Northern Hemisphere um, dating way back. And so we really did want to try to put this in Chile to capture a lot of the unknown um, objects and, and phenomena that are available from the Southern Hemisphere. So hopefully in the long term we'll, we'll be successful and people will want to fund something like this for the Northern Hemisphere, but nothing exists like it now. Uh, getting rid of the dust. So, it's a great question. I mean, the thing's gonna be open all night. Maybe you've got some, some animals who decide to <laughs> explore. Um, what we do is on a more frequent time scale, I wanna say maybe every couple months, there's a foam that you can spray onto the surface and then it evaporates and it pulls up the, the dust with it. So that's uh, something that we do ongoing. And then about every two years or so, we take the whole mirror off and we send it down a couple floors into uh, where the coating facility is and we completely recoat the mirror so then it comes out very clean um in my experience with these big facilities even lower altitude where you've got birds and things flying over and pooping on your mirror um, even after three or four years uh, your reflectivity is normally somewhere in the 90 percent range or higher if you've got a great uh, facility and it's very smooth surface um, and even after three or four years, the lowest I've seen them go is maybe 80% reflectivity. It looks awful. I mean, it looks like birds are pooping all over your mirror, but the actual measurement of the reflectivity is not so bad. So I think it's pretty reasonable to do the, the foam solution every few months and then a total recoat every two years. Okay, demo time. Okay, so start the demo. These are, we have about eight different investigations, uh, educational investigations specifically meant for the classroom. And so I just wanted to kind of walk through a sampling of the types of things we have in those. So here you see all of a sudden there's a, a supernova. You found it, woo! And then you're supposed to find your galaxy and you click on that. And now you're supposed to plot this point based on where we calculated the velocity and the distance. So I'm just gonna make up some uh, measurements here. Then you go look at a, another galaxy and you try to figure out where, oh, this is a tough one. And I think that's... Amanda, when you say plot the point, I mean, I mean, if I was the citizen scientist, would I be plotting the points? Maybe. So we haven't um, designed all of the citizen science projects yet. 
So right now, this is with an educational um, idea in mind. One of the capacities that students need to learn, especially in the kind of later stages of their pre-college days, is how to plot a point. And so this is one of the things that we're trying to train them how to do with this activity. It's definitely one of the requirements of uh, the curriculum in the US anyway. Okay, so we're gonna say that we've we found enough points. I'm gonna go, oh, I'm gonna save that. And here we are. And so now we can click here and we can find this line and you can see, try to fit a slope to that line and it gives you what this slope is. So you can save that, you go to the next one. Uh, and now you can see based on your measurement um, where, what the Hubble constant is. And here what we show is you can pick a different galaxy and put that in the center of the universe. Here we're trying to say, how do we know that we're in the center of the universe and everything is expanding away from us? So this little 3D plot shows what galaxies look like relative to each other if you pick different galaxies to be at the center. Um, okay, so we can do other things. Now we can do a light curve. So we pick out this galaxy and we see the changes in the brightness of the galaxy over time. And so they tend to get brighter and then they get fainter over time. And we can start to do things with this light curve to, uh, to get to astrophysical conclusions. So you can take this light curve and you try to fix, move it around and make it uh, match the shape of that light curve. And based on that, I'm forgetting what, ah, oh, there it is. Based on that, you can kind of squeeze it. Uh, you can start to make conclusions about what type of star exploded to create this supernovae. I hope it didn't like my answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so this, these are other examples where we're detecting objects in the solar system. So you try to find the object that's moving relative to um, the, the objects in the background. And then this one is sort of our solar system interaction. So as we start to detect more and more objects, you can start to make conclusions about what kind of object it is that we observed just from that image and from some of the, the orbital parameters that we measure over time. And so in all of these, you can start to increase the time that these things are orbiting around. You can get all kinds of information about the objects. And eventually we start to plot lots of different objects on here. And so you can uh, cruise around and in this way, we can start to identify different types of populations of objects and make conclusions about the formation of the solar system based on these interactions. I think this might be the last one. So this is one uh, that's large scale structure of the whole universe. These are redshift ranges. So those are distances from us. And the main conclusion of this one as it stands is if you look at higher redshifts, so this is 0.65, not so high, but if you look at galaxies here at this distance, you can see that they didn't really, they were sort of evenly distributed. There's some little clumpiness here, but it's not so much. And as we move towards closer and closer to us in the universe, we start to see much more of this filamentary structure forming such that in the nearby universe now we have these big voids of galaxies and galaxy clusters. And this structure is all determined by how gravity and dark matter and dark energy are distributed through the universe. So, congratulations, you reached the end of the demo. <laughs> Amanda, uh, we're extremely grateful to you in Cork Astronomy Club that you've taken time out of your day uh, to talk to us. Um, this has been a complete eye opener for me and I'm sure for lots of other of our members. And we'll certainly be delighted to keep in touch with you over the the next couple of years to see yeah. to see your 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 project to conclusion and when when it when it actually receives uh, um, first light in in the true sense, not just the engineering sense. Um, so uh, thanks very much for joining us from Arizona. G give our regards to Arizona from from Cork, um, and uh, I wish you well for the rest of the pandemic. I hope you manage to uh, get back into your offices in June, which you said is a possibility, although you didn't sound 100% confident about it. Um, and we look forward to uh, keeping in touch with you over the next couple of years. 
So thank thanks you. very much, Amanda. Very grateful indeed. Thank you.